Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this CAFI webinar on the ins and outs of life insurers, health and wellness incentivization programs. We are delighted to be joined today by three leading Canadian experts in this area of the life and health insurance industry. First, Patty Annabel, Annabel, excuse me, Assistant Vice President, Marketing Communications, Lumino Health, Sun Life. Next, Lisa Heath, CEO, Medi Resource Inc., business partner to Canada Life's Health Connected, and rounding out our esteemed panel is Paul Savage, head of product and pricing, including for Vitality at Manulife. Annabel leads the marketing and communications division of Lumino Health an innovation subsidiary launched by Sun Life and the largest health network in Canada, enabling over 50 million health touch points with Canadians. With over two decades of marketing leadership and nearly half of that time at Sun Life Canada, Patty understands how to lead integrated marketing strategies to drive platform adoption and engagement. In her current role, she oversees Lumino Health's brand, consumer marketing, client activa activa activation and B2B marketing. This requires a deep awareness of the health and wellness market in Canada in which Lumino Health operates. Patty holds a BA from the University of Guelph and currently lives in Kitchener. Lisa Heath has 30 years of experience in the broader health industry beginning as a community pharmacist. Early in her career, Lisa joined the managed care services group of Shoppers Drug Mart where she, managed, where she designed managed care programs with the goal of leveraging pharmacist care services to optimize employee health and productivity. Lisa then joined Buffett Taylor and Associates, a pharmacy benefits consulting firm, where she worked on projects related to alternative reimbursement, drug plan design, pharmacy benefits consulting, and managed healthcare. Lisa subsequently joined MediResource, where she has played an integral role in the evolution of the company's extensive collection of health information databases and its corporate wellness software, Health Connected. At MediResource, she has been involved in the design, implementation, and management of dozens of digital applications for retail pharmacies, insurers, and employers that focus on health and wellness. Paul Savage is the head of product and pricing for individual insurance in Canada at Manulife. In that role, Paul manages a team of professionals, including actuaries, product specialists, lawyers, and technical writers who develop and maintain the company's shelf of life insurance and living benefits products. That includes the development of new products and features, new business planning and strategy, product promotion, large case support, professional services, and product pricing. Paul joined Manulife in 2008 and over the next seven years spent time in U.S. insurance, U.S. retirement plan services, and global asset liability management before joining retail insurance in 2015. He is a fellow of both the Society of Actuaries and the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Welcome Patty, Lisa and Paul, we're delighted to have you with us today. My name is Keith Martin and I am co-executive director of the Canadian Association of Financial Institutions and Insurance or CAFI. On behalf of myself and my co-executive director colleague, Brendan Wicks, and the CAFI Board of Directors, thank you for joining our webinar today. CAFI is a not-for-profit industry association dedicated to the development of an open and flexible insurance marketplace. Our 15 members include the insurance arms of Canada's major banks and credit unions, along with their insurer business partners, which underwrite credit protection insurance and travel insurance. This is the first of three CAFI webinars that we'll be holding in the first half of 2022, all of which are focused primarily on issues related to life and health insurance policy and regulation in Canada. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to one or more of our three panelists during the Q&A session, for which we have allocated 20 minutes at the conclusion of today's webinar, please send them to me as the host using the Q&A function of Zoom, and I will pose them on your behalf. Unless you specifically request in your question that you wish to be identified as its source, I will pose all questions on an anonymous basis. I will also ask three poll questions during today's webinar on three topics. Are you in a health and wellness incentivization program currently? 
Would you plan to be in one in the future? And how important is the gamification element to your participation in such a program? So give that some thought and we'll be asking you those questions formally a little later. And just before we get underway, I want to extend a special welcome to some VIP guest attendees. In addition to many representatives from our 15 CAFE member companies and from our 10 associates, which supply essential services to our association and its members. We have attendees today from allied industry associations, such as the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association and the Travel Health Insurance Association and from insurance and financial services regulators and policymakers from across Canada, including the following, Quebec's Autorité des Marchés Financiers, or the AMF, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, or FISRA, the Ontario Ministry of Finance, the Government of Alberta, British Columbia Financial Services Authority, or BCFSA, the Insurance Council of BC, the Financial and Consumer Services Commission of New Brunswick, or FCNB, the Insurance Councils of Saskatchewan and the Canadian Insurance Services Regulatory Organizations, or CISRO. Welcome to you all. We'll now jump right into the webinar. Patty, Lisa, and Paul, my first question is, what are the major goals and objectives of your health and wellness incentivization programs? And Patty, let me start with you. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Um, so Lumino Health is, is more than just a program. It's an actual platform and it's, it's not just for Sun Life clients. It's open to all Canadians as well. Um, and really the, the overall goal is to engage Canadians and help them take action and empower them to take, um, to take action in their own health and own their health journey. So from an overall goal perspective, it's about engagement. It's about coming to the platform and, um, you know, find a healthcare provider that they might need and connect and book an appointment. It might be about learning about the latest in health through some of our content or explore new health products and services. And ultimately we want to be able to take people along their health journey and offer something for them um, wherever they might be on that journey. Well, thank you, Patty. Lisa, what about your organization? So my company is Medi Resource, and we produce uh, Health Connected. It is a uh, corporate wellness platform, and uh, we've been invited here because uh, Canada Life, one of our main clients, is uh, a CAFI member. Uh, so our product has objectives and goals for different uh, uh, audiences. So for plan members, uh, because we focus in the group health benefits area, uh, our goals for plan members are to decrease their health risks and improve their health skills. Uh, our objectives are to assess their health risk, educate and inform them about their risks, and provide them with opportunities to practice healthy tasks, which will hopefully lead to adoption of healthy behaviors. But we have slightly different goals too for the plan sponsor level, and our objectives there are to provide uh, an easy, low barrier to entry option for improving health. We aim to help them attract and retain talent by demonstrating their commitment to the well being of employees. And also, our goal is to help support benefit use by plan members by connecting them to the right resources at the right time based on personalized health risk assessment results. We help uh, plan sponsors improve decision making around benefits package design and other corporate wellness initiatives through uh, comprehensive data analytics. Uh, and then from the insurer's perspective, from uh, uh, for Canada Life, our client, uh, Health Connected aligns with their purpose, their overall purpose to improve the well-being of Canadians and improve the experience for their plan members and sponsors, help drive engagement and ultimately the health of plan members. So many levels. Excellent. That's very interesting. And I know we'll have a chance to dig into this a little bit more deeply a little later. But first, I'm going to ask Paul to uh, complete this opening question with uh, his thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Keith. So uh, at, at Manulife, you know, we're a big insurance company. And so we have a lot of different programs and things that we offer that might that, that would be considered a health and wellness offering. Uh, the one I'm going to focus on today is our Manulife Vitality program, which I would say is our premier health and wellness uh, offering and it's the one that offers incentives. And so essentially what it is, and I'll have more of a chance to talk about it throughout this, but it's a, a program that integrates with your insurance policy uh, to incentivize healthy behaviors, and it operates on a shared uh, value model. So essentially that by uh, a client 
doing healthy behaviors, you know, going out, exercising, getting a medical checkup and things like that, they become healthier, which is good for them. I think for obvious reasons, it's good for us uh, because if they live longer and healthier, then they're less likely to claim or they'll or they're claim uh, further out. I mean, everyone of us will at some point uh, have to claim in, the, in that situation, but um, we want it to be as late as possible. And then it's a uh, broader shared value for society because healthier people around, less of a burden on the healthcare system and all of that. So our goals are similar to what you heard from uh, from the other presenters today. It's really about getting people healthier, uh, making their lives better, helping them to live longer. And also, uh, so it's, it's an incentive, sort of a nudge and a drive to that, but it's also educating. A lot of people uh, like to use this program because it gives them a bit of a, a roadmap or a guideline of, you know, what type of activities and things are you, or am I earning points for? And if I don't really know, you know, I, I'd like to get healthy. I like the concept of getting healthy, but I don't know what to do. It gives us some easy things that we can push out messages and incentives for people to give them a little bit of a roadmap to improve their health. Interesting. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Now, let me just uh, follow up directly with you on, on um, what you just said and ask you, um, and just in terms of digging in a bit detail and more digging in in a little bit more detail, what target markets does your uh, program serve? Yeah, so that's a good, uh, it's a good question. So really the target market is, is everyone. So everyone who uh, has or buys an insurance product, our, our program, the Vitality program specifically, uh, has to be linked to an insurance product. So you've got to own either an individual product, which is my expertise or a group benefits plan that offers Vitality. Um, but it's a, it's a big misconception. One of the biggest things that we fight is that, you know, this is a program for marathon runners and I really have to go in and be very active to get any value and get any rewards and benefits. And it's completely not. Uh, in fact, if you think about that shared value model, it's actually the people who, uh, who are trying to improve that journey that we have more opportunity to you know, improve the health of. If you're not sure or you're unhealthy to begin with, or you've got you know, a medical condition that, uh, that you could benefit from getting under control, that's where you can really move the needle. So, you know, I was kind of actually thinking in my head that you may see me drinking my pop through the, now it is a diet. Uh, so I'll have that caveat out there through the presentation, but it's, you know, the members of the program that are successful are ordinary people. It's about, you know, getting moving, you know, take, take 5,000 steps a day, uh, take 10,000 steps, just going to the gym earns you points, getting a medical checkup, those type of things earn points. So, um, it's not for the young or the old or the healthy or unhealthy. It's really for anyone who is interested in improving their health is the target. So that, Paul, what about um, your, in your case, Lisa, could you elaborate on the target market? Yeah, so we have a product that can be used for individual life or cr uh, critical illness plans. Uh, but right now, our focus and our target is group uh, employee benefits, health and wellness benefits. Um, and uh, you can see that in our, our software because uh, we have opportunities for uh, teams uh, and we leverage the, the, the structure of an employment uh, environment uh, in our software. Uh, round it out for us with uh, the target sure. market for, for your organization. Sure. So Lumina Health is a little bit different. Um, well, we certainly work closely with our group uh, benefits business um, and work closely with our sponsors and, and group plan members. Uh, and we have Lumino embedded in multiple kind of group um, journeys. We're also open to all Canadians. And so, the you know, all the resources and products and services and finding providers and whatnot is open for anyone to use. And from a target market on the Canadian side, um, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, three or four different demographics. Um, but I would say the biggest one that you would, you would think of is those obviously that are interested in, in improving their health. Um, but also kind of that sandwich generation that has, you know, you still have kids at home, you're helping your parents. Um, and, you know, you're, you're not just taking care of your own health, you're taking care of several people's health journeys. Uh, so that's mostly where we see a lot of our engagement on the Canadian side, um, but definitely embedded throughout the Sun Life uh, benefit side as well. Excellent. Well, I think this is a perfect moment to launch into our first poll question. Uh, which I'll launch now, and I will invite those who are attending this to answer uh, yes or no. So the question is, have you participated in any health and wellness incentivization program like those being discussed in this webinar through either your group employee benefits coverage or individual life and health insurance coverage you have? So we'll give you a few moments and uh, we'll see in terms of our participants, our, our attendees, 
How many are uh, part of such a program? All right, well, we've got a, a good response rate and uh, a few more people are still joining, but um, the, the Poll results indicate that 46% of attendees are members of such a program and 55% are not. So a little under uh, half are uh, um, uh, participating in such a program. Do, do those numbers sound right to you in terms of the broader population or a little higher or lower? Um, and I, I pose that to any of you. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, as much as we love and ex as excited as we are about this program and we're rolling it out, it is relatively young in its journey in Canada. So it's not actually, you know, if we could get to 46% of Canadians, that would be a fantastic result. I'm guessing because of the group that we have here is a little more uh, involved in insurance, we might have be doing a little bit better. Um, so it, numbers. It, yeah, in terms of the numbers that are doing it. So it's, it's something that, you know, from I think all of us on the call perspective, we want to reach as many people uh, as we can, but it really depends on what what group you're looking at in terms of how many people that we've uh, we've got engaged in participating. If I could just add to that, I think the, the issue is a little bit nuanced too by are you aware that you're, you, you have access to a program like that? Because I think um, certainly one of the lessons learned from, from our experience is that there is a substantive portion of the market out there who doesn't know that they have access to programs like any of the ones that uh, my panelists and myself are offering. I completely agree with that that statement, Lisa and Paul. It's, it's yeah, what, what do you know you have available to you versus, you know, are you using it? We have an it, unknown yeah. benefit for many Canadians. Yeah. Actually, I think it, it's part of an overall issue too, where I think there are a lot of Canadians who don't know what their benefits offer them at all. And uh, I think that that, that that issue sort of affects us as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so I would like to uh, move on to a, a next question coming out of that poll, which, and I'll start with you, Lisa, on this one, which is what are the key features of your program in terms of the good health and wellness activities and actions that it incentivizes and the incentives and rewards that it offers? Okay. Um, so I like to answer this kind of question by stating from first principles uh, what the foundation is that our, our product is built on. And uh, so we're designed on the principle that intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, as well as rewards, are necessary for positive behavior change. So we have a system for extrinsic motivation and rewards, and it can cover things like gift cards, cash, discounts, um, and to support it, we provide features like an underpinning system of points, badges, medals. Uh, we have uh, reporting that allows a plan sponsor to fulfill incentives. Uh, we have a promotions feature that helps communicate what extrinsic rewards are available for a campaign or for use of our software. Um, we provide a ton of flexibility for plan sponsors to choose whatever reward or reward model they want versus having a fixed integration with a particular rewards fulfillment vendor. And we also can rec recommend reward models based on evidence. From the intrinsic motivation side, we offer a change model incorporated into our assessments. We have a health risk assessment tool, and we also have an explicit behavioral assessment uh, tool called the health skills profile. Uh, we work to peak member curiosity, which is actually something that really helps from the intrinsic motivation side. Um, we work to peak member curiosity about their health through offering thousands of health articles uh, and pieces of information about health. We provide hundreds of small scope healthy tasks that plan members can master. And lastly, we focus on team activities to support a sense of community. So uh, the uh, I think the first set of features that I described, they're all around the uh, extrinsic rewards and fulfilling those. And then the second part was just to talk about how there's other features which aren't really linked to incentives, but are fundamental to achieving the objectives of our software. Lisa, before I go to Patty and Paul on this question, just a follow up that I'll ask them as well, which is a lot of this sounds like the carrot versus the stick, a sort of positive reinforcement. 
Um, is, is there behavioral evidence that that works uh, uh, as well as, you know, fear of getting sick or fear of not getting uh, uh, the sort of result that you want? Could, could you comment on that? So I'm going to uh, fall back a little bit on my training as a pharmacist. Um, you'd be shocked how scaring people doesn't actually work very well. Um, it's, it's, it's not a strategy that always works uh, for people. Um, there's been lots of studies on medication adherence, and it's not really supported by people being scared into it. Uh, when we look at um, behavior change uh, from the scope of our uh, software, uh, what we can see is that there, there is evidence that extrinsic rewards, like stuff you get, um, long term, it might not actually support positive uh, behavior change in the area of health. It certainly can be helpful for getting immediate engagement. Uh, but long term, there, there, there is a bit of a positive of uh, evidence uh, that supports the long term effects there. Uh, but that said, it can help immediate uh, engagement in a tool like ours. Well, that's really interesting, Lisa. Thank you. Patty? Yeah, just to piggyback on that comment, I agree with Lisa. I think it, there's definitely that carrot in immediate engagement. But then once you get them to the platform and you can learn more about them, it becomes more of that customized experience, right? So that you, hopefully you, over time, you build that relationship, you deliver that value, and you're able to actually um, move the dial on, on health outcomes. Um, as far as you know, the, the first question um, around you know, health and wellness activities and actions, we enable general education. We know health literacy is is low in Canada, and our belief is if we can increase our literacy through our education and, and through our partners, we, we partner with a number of credible health voices like CAMH or Kids Help Phone, for example, in the mental health space. We have several different health topics that we cover, um, but we partner with them and create, you know, that, that content that helps educate them to take the next action. Um, so we, we, can, we reward basic things like joining our newsletter, um, following our social channels, you know, some of those, those smaller actions uh, right through through to booking the appointment if you if that's the next step for you on the journey. Um, and similar to, to what Lisa mentioned, rewards can be anything from gift cards. We know our community loves things like you know the weighted blankets or app subscriptions to different you know health health apps or different products and services that we found that are innovations in and of themselves. Um, so we we definitely kind of have the full gamut of what those rewards could look like. Um, and when it comes to like some of the bigger rewards that we've done in the past has been you know, during the pandemic, we've obviously worked with all of our healthcare providers. We were able to identify who off offered virtual services, and then the reward would be, you know, getting an iPad and enabling the the actual uh, appointment itself. Um, so, depend again, it, it's customized and relevant depending on the target, depending on the program um, that we're that we're running at that time, or or what we need to be able to do to enable them and empower them to take another action. Flynn, Paul, I'm going to ask you to jump in on this. Great, thanks, Keith. So, yeah, the Manual Vitality Program, you know, it, it really hits kind of what you've outlined on the nose. I'll, I'll talk mostly about our individual insurance program that I talked about. We do have the Group Benefits Program where there are some nuances by uh, by sponsor a little bit, but the general principles are are, uh, are the same. But essentially what we have in the program is a member signs up and opts in, and then uh, they have, we have a whole host of what we would call points earning activities that the member can earn points and then achieve a status. So you start at bronze, you can get silver, gold, or platinum status through the program. And the points earning activities are some of the things I talked about before. So it could be uh, things like physical activity, you know, exercising. You can, uh, if you have a tracker that take you take a certain number of steps. If you check in at the gym, if you participate in a in a run like a 5K or some kind of organized athletic event. Um, we also have a host of preventative activities, if you get your uh, flu shot, if you get certain medical screenings done, if you go and get your uh, get blood work done, which we actually, as part of the program, we provide an opportunity to do that. Uh, and you know your certain metrics are within healthy ranges, you get points for that. So there's, there's quite a wide range of basically what you would consider as healthy behaviors that you can earn these points and the statuses. The cool thing and the exciting thing uh, as an actuary, this is the type of thing that, that I find exciting, is that it creates a new dynamic for us in that those things are all dynamic over time. So I could tell you what, what is in the snapshot of the points earning activities today, but in terms of a year, five years, 10 years from now, we can tailor those to whatever the most recent medical advancements are, which is something historically we've never been able to do. It's kind of been you sell the block 
50 years from now, we've got 500,000 policies in the book. Can we just kind of hope for the best and pay the claims and ho hope that it goes well? We now have the opportunity to change that. And I'll give you one quick example of last year, we rolled out an additional points earning activity for the COVID vaccine. So if you went and got your vaccination and submitted it through the Vitality app, you got 400 points, which gets you towards a higher status. So kind of cool, we're able to see what's happening in the world and, and push out something to our members to incentivize them to take a healthy behavior. And in that shared value model I talked about before, obviously governments around the world have been trying to figure out ways to do it. And so here we have an opportunity as a private company that's invested in our uh, the health of our uh, customers, we're able to put money on the table to, to drive that. So that's the, uh, the kind of what people need to do or the incentivizing part of it. In terms of what they get, you know, it's linked to a couple of things. There's their product integration. So it actually integrates with insurance premium. The higher status you get, you can earn discounts from your premium. And then if you don't hit the status next year, you lose the discount, which is uh, to your point on behavioral science, much more powerful. People don't want to lose the discount that they've got, right? If they already don't have it, they're not quite as nudged to, uh, to get it. And then we have a whole suite of rewards kind of in two categories of, there's some rewards that are sort of circular. You know, if you engage, you get a wearable device, uh, a fitness tracker, or, you know, healthy food and things like that, that can help you kind of spiral and get more healthy. So there's, we try to focus on those. And then we have some just pure incentivization type rewards like hotel discounts and gift cards and things like that, that are purely just rewards for people that got healthy. Um, we're able to give them a, a kind of a whole suite of, uh, of rewards. Really interesting, Paul, because uh, one of the questions that I've just gotten from the audience, and maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more, uh, given that you spoke about COVID vaccines, was how these programs can support Canadians getting vaccinations or help Canadians towards preventive medicines or treatments. So starting with you, Paul, you, you, you've indicated that your program does, does do that. Yeah, and it's, it's the most, again, the most exciting thing for me about the program is being able to have that connection with our insured, uh, our insured population. I, I tell this story sometimes that, that one time uh, when I was, we did a survey, conducted a survey as manual life, where we went into manual life customers and asked them a number of questions. And the first question was, do you have a manual life insurance policy? And 20% of them said no. And so here it is, people that have insurance policies, 20% of them don't even know they have an insurance policy. So it just tells you to- Be discouraging. Of, right, so, so this now gives us that, whether it's through the app or the email, it gives us that direct channel to be able to provide uh, the latest, greatest incentives and, and medical information to them. Um, and those preventative style activities are really are the focus of the program. You know, it's nice to keep people kind of ongoing and being and thinking healthy, uh, but those are some opportunities to really move the needle. You know, if you think about the health outcome for someone who's vaccinated versus unvaccinated through the pandemic, in particular, if they're in a population that is at a high risk for COVID, you can be making a very significant uh, impact to that person in a short period of time where it, some of the other things in the program are slower. You know, get, exercising and all that is, is great, but that'll affect your sort of longer term. So it's nice to have a mix of the, you know, real short-term stuff, behavioral impacts that we can drive the needle on um, and things like checkups and taking your meds and things like that are all very important in the short term with some of those long-term establishing those good behaviors. Saying, so, Patty, what, what about uh, you? What, do you want to comment on this COVID vaccination and preventive yeah. medicine? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say we're not, so just on the, the just to tie into Paul's uh, talk about gamification and the points and stuff, we don't, we don't have gamification on our platform. Um, we're not tied to an insurance um, uh, product the way Vitality is. However, we do the incentives just based off of, you know, education and that proactive, you um, empowerment, right? The, educating them so that they can take the next action. Um, when it came to, you know, the vaccinations pandemic and whatnot, we have a resource page. We did the outbound emails to Sun Life clients. You know, here's where you can go. Here's some information. Here's, you know, uh, links to government websites and whatnot to learn more. Um, so it was really being a resource for them versus gamifying them taking that action. Um, and I think the other, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, talking about being more proactive, we obviously were seeing a rise in mental health 
right? With all of the, the, what the pandemic has done for all of us and our kids and people around us, our friends. Um, so we were really proactive in getting out a lot of communication around mental health and mental health resources, whether it was doing webinars, um, answering direct questions from, you know, people that were attending our webinars. We had thousands of people sign up to attend our webinars and, and get access to psychologists and psychiatrists and get their questions answered. Um, so being more proactive in that way uh, was really helpful in, in moving the, the, the conversation and, and getting people to talk more about what we're all going through and and how the impact it's having on all of us so not just the vaccinations but also kind of seeing what else was going on in the world and where else we can be supportive well lisa i'd like to hear your thoughts on this well uh so the interesting thing based on what patty said and what paul said is that i i know that health connected was chosen by canada life as the the product that they would use because we are uh, uh, able to address such broad needs uh, because we have such a broad array of health content, health information and features. So we actually did both as well. We did health information uh, on COVID. We have a monthly email newsletter. So there was outbound information about COVID. So we certainly uh, for Canada Life uh, and its clients uh, made sure that we supported their education around COVID and the vaccinations and whatnot. Um, but we also, uh, for Canada Life, did a, 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 a different format, a model of gamification, but uh, Canada Life uh, ran a, a prize draw and you could get uh, multiple opportunities at their pretty amazing set of price, prizes uh, if you could uh, uh, show that you had gotten a COVID vaccine. So we both, we did the information, the education part and the gamification part to try to move the needle on vaccination rates. So well, I'd like to pick up on this theme of uh, gamification. I know, Patty, you said that, that you don't currently offer that as part of your program, but I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that you have some thoughts about how it, what its potential might be. And so I'd like to ask all three of you about gamification and its relation in, in relation to the future of these sorts of programs and the ultimate success of these programs. And I'd like to also ask you to touch on technology as part of that. Things like wearables, artificial intelligence and machine learning and what role those play in the evolution of these programs. Lisa, perhaps I could begin with you. Sure. So um, gamification to us, the way we interpret it, it, it is a tool. Um, it's a way to engage people. It makes things playful for folks uh, to get them engaged. But it's not the same thing as, as intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivations. And it's also not the same thing as extrinsic or intrinsic rewards. Um, and behavior change has to take all of those things into consideration. So I think gamification is really useful. I believe that uh, most of our clients feel the same way. Uh, so we definitely feel that it's an important thing for us to invest in. And, and we have we have a whole suite um, of tools um, available for gamification. And it's got a really good, robust underpinning of points and medals and badges to support it. But um, the way we do things is we try and make things really flexible for our plant sponsors. So they can choose to be really involved in gamification or we're not just depends on what what they want to do and most of our features are all configurable when it comes to this so you're not stuck in a model you can sort of you have the flexibility to choose what your model for gamification is going to be uh, when you're a plan sponsor working with our software um, in terms of wearables so we think wearables are really important for the future um, and we've already integrated wearables into our platform um, but we always maintain three principles uh, when it comes to wearables. Um, the first thing is, is that, uh, you know, dead giveaway, I'm a pharmacist, which means I'm really in interested in evidence-based medicine. And uh, we're only going to incorporate wearables where there's evidence to support use of wearables. And, and I'm talking like finding stuff in the medical literature uh, that proves that it's useful and, and valid. Um, the second thing is we're going to think about, we, we always think about accessibility. Um, and, and part of accessibility is the fact that not everybody has wearables. So are we, as a result, we build everything in our platform so you can still use all the features, even if you don't have a wearable. Um, and the third thing is, is just the big brother concerns of the user. Uh, we don't want to frighten people off that they, you know, the, with the sense that they have to share all that data if they use our 
our platform. So all of our features are built so that you don't have to use wearable data or involve it if you're not comfortable with sharing that level of information. Voluntary. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Patty, your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I agree with with a lot of what Lisa said. I think they're tools, and I think they have a place a, a place to play, um, depending on you know where on the journey you're helping somebody. And I think you really have to think about the target market. Who are you trying to help? Are they are they incentivized um, by points and badges and whatnot versus you know winning something or a contest or a, a gift card um, and making sure that you're you're putting it in the right place at the right time so that you're ha helping people in more relevant where they're at with their journey. Um, so I, I definitely think they think they're important tools. I don't think they're going to go away. I think you'll see them embedded further. But Lisa makes a great point on accessibility, right? We've got you have to make sure that you're you're thinking of your whole audience and who's who's there and what their motivations are and because I think the fear too from a marketing standpoint on gamification is you're going to get early engagement early on and then they might drop off and we've seen that with certain programs um, but overall if there's that internal motivation to really get healthier they're going to stay they're going to want and you've created that value they're going to come back and they're going to want to continue to return if you're adding value to their life. So I think it's it's a matter of really understanding your target market. It's a matter of making sure that you're being relevant at the right right part of their health journey for them um, and, and making sure that you're not doing it just for the engagement that might drop off later, but actually delivering that value over time. Well, thank you for that, Patty. And Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, the gamification is really important and um, you know, gamification and some of the terms we use on the call, behavioral science, behavioral economics, have a bit of a bad connotation. You, know, you kind of think of this puppet master trying to do things to make you behave a certain way. But really the gamification is really just, as it says in the name, it's about making it fun. It's about making it like a game and we all like to play games. And so myself, you know, I, I own a manual life vitality policy. And one of the features you get is if you hit a certain number of active points, you get a wheel spin and the, you spin the wheel and you get a certain number of points. You can win a gift card. And my, my wife, who's also a member, you know, we always watch each other's wheel spin and it's like Wheel of Fortune. It's a little bit fun. You get to spin it and see it and see the points that you earn. So I think it's, you know, it's great. It's a great part of the program. It's a great way to do it. We know from, from experience and from research that it is a way to get people to engage, to make it a little bit more fun and interesting for people. It's not, uh, as was also mentioned, uh, not the be all end all, right? I mean, it's a good way to get people in and it's a good, I mean, if they're gonna be doing it, they may as well be having fun. So we want it to be as you know, as fun as possible. Uh, but that's when you start to see that kind of sequence of people start doing it because of the, the fun, because of the points, because of the Apple Watch, because of the hotel trip. But then when we start to hear some of the testimonials of people that are engaged for six months, 12 months, a year or two, it's when they get their next health checkup and their cholesterol levels are down and their you know BMI is now in a healthy range and they feel better and all of those things are what keep them going. And then the rewards just end up being a bonus for them. So it's an important part of the program, but it's not you know the entirety around, around that piece. And then on the technology aspect and the wearables, you know, with our program, you know, wearable is not required. You can do you can be very successful in the vitality program without a wearable. Uh, but the wearables and technology in general is very important just in terms of what um, what I shared before, right? There's the healthy behaviors, but then there's our ability to, to know that you're doing a healthy behavior. So we know that exercise is important. We know that getting steps, being active is important. We know that getting a full night's sleep is important, but you know we can't follow you around and watch all day long how you're behaving. So we need some kind of a method to be able to uh, to track and look at those certain things. Uh, to be able to see, you know, are you actually getting doing your exercise and things like that. So in my, you certainly don't need to. And in the case of our program, we've set it up so that if you get those points, you know, if your cholesterol is in a healthy range and your BMI and you're still not smoking, you attest to these things, you can get them, uh, you, you can still achieve the highest statuses, but in, it's easier and more fun in my mind if you're, you know, if you've got the Apple Watch or if you, even your, you know, your iPhone or your phone now will track your steps and things like that, then you get to really take advantage of the full power of the program. And as Lisa was saying, you know, it's also, it's not just about knowing it's the wearable is helping you, right? It's, it's got things, it's got feedback loops for you. It's got, you know, if you've seen uh, 
the Apple Watch commercials, you know, potentially you've got new medical advancements, you've got the ability to, it's got fall detection and stuff like that. So if you're in a situation, you know, you can get emergency help. So it's, uh, they're coming a long way even today, but I expect as we move out in the future, more and more, those wearables are going to have more features that are even more beneficial to your health, not just about the tracking and getting rewarded. Thank you all three of you for, for those interesting answers. I think this is a perfect moment to launch into our second poll question. Uh, so I'll just launch that right now. The question is, if you were offered the opportunity to participate in an insurer's health and wellness incentivization program, how important would the gamification aspects, earning rewards, benefits, goal setting, tracking of results, et cetera, be to your yes, no decision? So we'll just give folks a few moments to answer that. Just wait a few more moments. People are still answering. Good. Share the results. And uh, interestingly, quite a few people said that it would be important. 46% uh, said it was somewhat important. 22% said it was very important. So of our very unscientific poll of uh, participants or attendees in this webinar, uh, fully 68% said it's somewhat or very important. Does that, does that sound right to you? Do you think do you think that's the way Canadians in general uh, operate? I think in, in my experience, yes. I also think this is the exact type of thing that we wouldn't do the research via a poll, although it's fun to hear what people say. And all, a lot of these things, you know, what, what we all say and think, and myself included, is different from when you kind of get in there and how you actually behave. Uh, so it is always fun to poll people and say, you know, how do they think they're going to behave and how do they think they act and how many steps do they think they take and all of that. But uh when you see, you know, the great thing about having these ongoing programs that can change and develop, we can, you can test different things and see, you know, which ones get the best engagement. And it might surprise you again, even what engages you might not be what, uh, what you would have said. Interesting. Lisa? Okay. So the funny thing is we actually pulled up our office. <laughs> And yes, they all wanted game, a large portion wanted gamification. But what we realized as we were looking, just like Paul said, when we looked at who responded, you could tell that it was a particular demographic who wanted gamification. Um, younger people? And, pardon me? Is it younger people? It was younger people. Absolutely. Interesting. Patty? Yeah, I think it, it that just proves, right? It goes back. It's a tool. <laughs> And it depends, um, you know, it depends on the target market you're going after. Um, and I completely agree with you, Paul, what people say they would like. Um, you know, we certainly see that in some of our research, but when it's completely different when it's implemented and where you're seeing people go and what they're doing. Um, and who doesn't want a gift card? So it's, it's, it is fun and light. <laughs> right. Well, I have a couple of questions from the audience that I'm going to quickly ask before we get back to the, uh, to the questions that was uh, in the pipeline uh, of, of, of our own webinar. And the first one is from, a, uh, from an attendee that asks, is there much of a drop off in user engagement in wellness programs? For example, are you expecting that a high volume of customers will be engaged in year one and then drop off afterwards? Patty, has that been your experience in your program? It hasn't. There's been smaller programs um, where maybe the points didn't really match the um, the brand and the action that we were asking uh, that we did see some drop off, but overall we have not we have not seen um, major drop off with engagement uh, over time. And I think that comes back to making sure that you are offering relevant information at the right time and and really delivering the value because then people will stick around and see what else is there is for them. So. Um, yeah, I think it's just really understanding your audience and being able to deliver the value against it, and you you won't those numbers won't drop. Your experience as well, Lisa. Uh, our experience is that 
communication actually matters the very most. It could be because I, our focus is the group benefit um, uh, market. So we're dealing with uh, plan sponsors, organizations. And what's most important if you want engagement is to tell people, your employees very specifically, what they, you are offering to them in terms of health and wellness. Um, it's more important from our experience than the gamification because if people just don't even know that the tool is available and you don't make any effort to tell them that these benefits are available, they're not gonna use them. Paul? Yeah, yeah and I think in my perspective, I mean, there, so, there, I think people would be surprised, and you know, we have we have a table in the model somewhere that says exactly how many people we think are going to stick around in the program. But we, um, I think you'd be surprised by how many and how how persistent people are in the program, especially those that are engaged. Of course, people drop off. You know, when they buy the the product and it's shiny and new, and they jump in. You know, ten years later, we don't expect the same number of people to be engaged. But there is, you know, a permanent large cohort of people who stay engaged, buy into the program, believe in it. Um, see their health improve and stay engaged throughout the whole program. The other thing I'll say is we talked about program engagement, um, but both Patty and Lisa talked earlier about you know, each individual's journey through this and the gamification and the engagement being the, the first thing. Part of our hope is that we've instilled these behaviors and these, these lifestyle changes into people, whether or not they, they keep logging into the app and submitting their activities and things like that. Some of that may drop off, but even in some of those people that have dropped off, we believe a lot of them are still engaging in those healthy behaviors. They've still learned and soaked in the information that we provided to them, uh, whether they're you know, fully engaged in the program and the materials uh, as much as they were when they started. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, I wanna ask you a question about data and privacy. Um, we certainly seen in technology, some of the conversation around technology firms collecting uh, massive amounts of personal information and some of the concerns that uh, some, some individuals have around that. And so in terms of your program, some commentators from the medical ethics, consumer privacy and civil society sectors have expressed some concerns that the personally identifiable data collected by wearables uh, could potentially compromise individual privacy and also that it could cause the development of privately held individual health data that could undermine the privacy import and importance of publicly health publicly held insurance health records. Um, how do you respond to these issues? And uh, you know, how, how, how do you reassure Canadians that that's not something they should be worried about? Um, Patty, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, I think this is such a, an important topic when it comes to, you know, health overall and, and a lot of industries. I mean, we want to make sure our data collection is strictly enforced and adhered to. We want to be able to find that balance where, you know, we're respecting the privacy, we're respecting, you know, not collecting data that we don't need to be using, um, but also know enough at the aggregate level to be able to offer, you know, information in that relevant journey. So um, it's something that I, I think as a consumer, you want to make sure that you're, you're you know who you're doing business with. You're, you know, knowing that uh, you're trusting that that brand and that company with your data. Um, and as marketers and myself, it's it's making sure working very closely with your compliance and privacy officers to know what we're collecting, how we're storing it, how we're using it, what the potential use is long term, um, to make sure we're complying and and being extremely respectful to the Canadians' um, data because health is sensitive and you have you can never be too. Uh, too careful when it comes to that data collection and the use of it. And Lisa, I see you nodding, so I'm, I'm presuming you're, you're in agreement. Absolutely, uh, and also I would just add that um, people want this information, right? Uh, people want to have access to their medical info. They keep asking for more of it. The wearables are here to stay from my perspective. Um, and, you know, we're really open to the regulatory changes that have to happen as this whole data, AI, all these things are evolving in technology and the regulatory needs to move with it. Um, regulatory doesn't frighten my group. I think it's because we've done so many projects that are directly involved in healthcare and uh, you know software that deals with prescriptions and lab tests. So it doesn't scare us. And I would actually even welcome um, the, the, the uh, you know, good solid uh, uh, regulation around it. Um, because that's the way to make sure that uh, private records, uh, record holders uh, are compliant and, and respecting consumers. 
Oh, sorry, Keith, we can't hear you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, that's very interesting. And I'm going to follow up with you in a moment about that regulatory issue. But uh, first, Paul, if you just want to uh, finish off your, your thoughts on this. Sure. I mean, echoing what everyone said, right? The, the, this is one of the more fun topics. I love when I get in, get to talk about vitality and improving health and all that. But, you know, first and foremost, our biggest uh, commitment to our customers is, is the trust, right? They're trusting us with their money. They're trusting us with their financial future, the future of their beneficiaries, their kids, their family, their loved ones. Uh, and privacy falls in that category. So absolutely the most important thing that we focus on before we talk about having fun and wheel spins and things like that is getting our foundation shored up in terms of privacy and all of that. And as an insurance company, we already you know, handle and work with very confidential information, underwriting medical information that comes in. And so all of those same kind of controls and policies are in place for anything that we get related to this. In our Vitality program in particular, we have additional layers of controls around what information uh, we get as an insurance company. Uh, so for example, in terms of we, we know the statuses that customers get because we have to be able to give them rewards and change their uh, vitality premiums, but it becomes depersonalized. So I can't tell you know what customer A's BMI is or what their cholesterol level, level is and things like that. So we have some uh, privacy controls that are in place there that, uh, that just provide an extra level of comfort, I think, for our, our clients who uh, who actually are craving that, that feedback and craving that information, but they just want to make sure that we're using it in the way that uh, that they're comfortable with. It's very helpful. And at least I'm going to start with you in this follow up on the uh, regulatory issue. And the question is, what challenges or impediments, if any, does the regulatory environment? I'm talking here about legislation, regulations, rules, guidelines cause for the development and, and advancement of health and wellness incentivization programs? Uh, okay, so to answer that question, I'll just first say that we look at, when we look at regulatory environments for our product, we look at information security, privacy, we think about accessibility uh, laws, uh, we think about CRA, tax law, and uh, we think about the new UDAP rule that's been proposed. Um, and uh, like my answer actually is the same as before. I think they're, they're, they're not so much challenges or problems because regulatory generally, um, you know, is, is there to protect consumers. So I think it's the more, it's the attitude of rolling with it and trying to look at the best things that the regulatory is trying to achieve. And, and what are you going to do about it? You, you, you got to do something to protect your consumer and make sure that they, um, you know, have all the protections they ought to have. Um, I do have some personal opinions, which is around accessibility. I think those laws in Canada are evolving, and I think we're going to see more and more impact uh, on businesses like ours, on softwares like ours from an accessibility perspective. Um, and I also have a, a belief that the new UDAP rule that's been proposed by FISRA is going to help in our particular industry to provide some clarity around um, extrinsic rewards uh, and, and incentivization of uh, users. Yep, so thank you, Lisa. Just, just for those who might not know, UDAP is, stands for Unfair or Deceptive Acts or Practices and is a, a new rule that has just been adopted by the Ontario regulator, FISRA. So uh, that, that's what Lisa is referring to. Patty, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I completely agree with Lisa. It's the intention is protection, right? And I think it's not a matter of um, problems or challenges. It's it's a constant communication. It's constant learning. It's staying close with you know compliance, risk, privacy, all of that, and and partnering and saying you know where do we go from here? What do I need to evolve? What do we need to tweak? I think if you're keeping the lines of communication open, it's it's about it you know, having that protection and making sure you're doing what's right by the customer. I think we we individually want that, right, for ourselves and we wouldn't want to do anything um, for our consumers on our platform that would hinder that. So I think it's knowing the intention is protection and working uh, with with your, your business partners to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Great, thanks, Patty. Paul, over to you. Yeah, I mean, our relationship with our regulators is great in general, but it's been great around the Vitality program. And at the end of the day, what I said to open up the call is that the program is about making Canadians healthier. And we've got great you know, feedback from the regulators around uh, wanting to achieve that same goal, right? We want to, uh, both just because it's just a, a nice thing for all of us to, to care about, but it also has benefits across the society for everyone as much as we can get things rolled out and make Canadians healthier. So it's really about some of those things 
that we talked about earlier, everyone's aligned to the goal. So it's making sure we do it in a way that, you know, complies with the rules that are out there and that, you know, we take into account privacy concerns and, and all of that. Uh, but we have a lot of support for trying to achieve that goal. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another uh, audience question. We only have five minutes left. You've been a fantastic panel. The time has just flown by. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the attendees uh, share uh, my view that it's, it's been very insightful. So uh, we're just going to have to try to uh, squeeze in the last couple of questions in the last few minutes. And, uh, and one of them is from the audience. And, and Lisa, it gets to this point that you raised about positive is better than negative. And uh, you, you know people don't respond as as, as uh, to 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 sort of fear fear mongering, and so the, the the question sort of touches on that. It says, what happens if you don't see changes in wellness in one of these programs? Say your BMI stays the same over time, or your cholesterol levels don't get better. Do your premiums go up? Do you face other negative effects? So maybe Lisa, since you raised this before, I'll, I'll start with you again. Okay, so I would say this, uh, we are always dealing with this uh, one force that we can't ever change, and that is called time. We're all getting older. Uh, in many ways, if someone's BMI doesn't change, that's a good thing. So I think, unfortunately, um, it gets really complicated looking at what is a person's wellness. And I think the medical literature and um, the benchmarking of out there in the literature shows this. It's really hard to measure this. Um, it's, it's hard to prove that a program, just like Paul said, people might actually be still doing these healthy tasks, even though a campaign with an engaging um, uh, prize is not available. Uh, so I think the thing is, is you can't necessarily, if you don't see positive outcomes in something that's easily measured, you can't, it's hard to say that the thing wasn't a success um, because, you know, not getting worse is sometimes a victory in itself. Um, and then I also think that, you know, if you look at traditional models of testing of, of you know, return on investment and whatnot, it's too short a time frame that everybody's looking at. Um, health and wellness is years to prevent that heart attack, you know, that could come in your 60s. Um, so, you know, it's very, it's a very nuanced answer that you would give. Sorry, I can't answer that yes or no. Understood. And, and getting older is better than the alternative. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, in terms of the, so I guess the basic question of, you know, if your BMI and things don't improve, do your premiums go up? So our, in the Vitality program specifically, it's really built around discounting and incentives. So, you know, you could lose your, if you don't engage, then then you can lose your discount is really what, what the, the worst case that happens to you other than getting unhealthy. But really it is that disengagement. So that's really the thing that can get you out of the status is if you stop engaging, you stop doing the things. It's not really about the outcomes per se. It's about engaging and in, in those healthy behaviors and really what we've seen you know one of the conversations when we started this is okay what if i uh oh, the questions that we get back from people when we talk about it is what if i strap my apple watch to my dog and they run around or what if i go to the gym and i check in and then i go home like and i'm getting all these points the reality is we know in our experience that that people won't do that right if you go to the gym and check in you're like, okay well i already came here i may as well go on the treadmill for 15 minutes or whatever and then it it snowballs so I will say it's really about engagement. That said, I would challenge anyone, it's very hard to be engaged and do all of these behaviors and not see or feel some kind of improvement, whether it comes through in a specific metric like BMI, just the fact that you're doing them, you will be improving your health in one way or another. Fine, thank you, Paul. Patty? I, I agree with both of you. I think, um, I think just come full circle. That's why engagement is something that all three of us are so uh, um, engaged in and want it and tracking and making sure that we can continue to have the engagement because over time, the more engaged you are, the better the outcomes. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that with the time. Fine. Okay, <laughs> time to launch our final poll right at the end of this webinar. How likely would you be to enroll and participate in a life and health insurance-based health and wellness incentivization program in the future if offered the opportunity? So we'll just wait a few moments and, uh, and see what the poll results are. All right, well, we've, uh, we've got 
good answers in terms of uh, the focus that the three of you have, and I'm sure it's because of the inspirational words that you've shared. Uh, we have 88% who say they're somewhat likely or very likely to join such a program in future. So um, that is an excellent result. And uh, um, I, I think that's a great way to end our webinar. Before we sign off formally, uh, we only have a few seconds left. Uh, Paul, Patty, Lisa, in that order, just your final thoughts and final uh, words of wisdom to the wise. Uh, uh, Paul? Yeah, I think... I mean, it was a great conversation. Great to see some of the the feedback coming through in those in those polls. I think the last thing I'd say is, you know, this is growing. It's it's not um, you know prevalent today where you'd see if you if you go out and talk to your ten friends, people that are engaged in the program. But this is something that I believe, and I think a lot of people believe, is a big part of our future. So um, a great, it's a great opportunity to attend sessions like this, get informed, start thinking about it, and uh, and you know, opening your mind to all of these different opportunities that are available and you know, go and check your group benefits plan and things like that because you may actually have uh, a login sitting there waiting for you. That's good advice, Patty. Absolutely. Um, I would just say the marketer in me wants to leave you with context is king. The more you know about... Um, the more you know about your audience, the more you can help them and, and really deliver on that value. So it's not just content, but the context of your audience can really help deliver more value. Thank you for that, Patty. And Lisa, last word to you. So mine is a little tag along to Patty's, and it's to think holistically about your people. It's not one strategy good that's going to work. It's probably 20. Uh, so when you're looking at products and services for improving health and wellness, think about 20 different strategies, not just one. So, well, that's great advice. Uh, on behalf of all our attendees and on behalf of Kathy, Paul, Patty, Lisa, thank you so much for such an insightful and interesting webinar. We are really appreciative. And to all those who attended today, thank you for uh, participating. Uh, we really ap appreciate your being in this uh, webinar as well. So uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. And thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.